Caroline Jones today. Patricia Jones joins us from MIT in Boston, where she is a professor of art history, as well as the director of the History Theory of Criticism group. Her scholarship focuses mostly on modern and contemporary art with a specific lens on technological methods of production, analysis, and communication. Um, Professor Jones studied art history at Harvard University and completed her PhD at Stanford. Prior to completing her degrees, she worked as a curator in museum, in, in museum administration, holding positions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, as well as at the Harvard University Art Museums, where she created two documentary films. Jones's exhibitions and films have been shown at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Hirschhorn Museum in Washington, D.C., um, the Hara Museum in Tokyo, and numerous other arts institutions. Additionally, she has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, and the Newhouse Center for the Humanities at Wellesley College, among many others. Caroline Jones is the author of multiple books that have garnered attention and praise from both arts and educational organizations. They include Modern Art at Harvard, which was published in 1985, uh, Bay Area Figurative Art, 1950-1965, which was released in 1990, Machine in the Studio, Construction of the Post-War American Artists, published in 1998, and I Sight Alone, Clement Greenberg's Modernism and the Bureaucratization of the Senses, which was released in 2005. Um, Jones has published writing on subjects that range from new media art, biennial culture, to Tino Segal and Francis Picaglia, and has been featured in multiple journals, including Art Forums, Critical, Inqu Critical Inquiry, Res, and Science in Context. Her current and ongoing research is based on globalism and new media art, and her inquiries will be published in a new book titled Desires for the World Picture of the Global Work of Art. We are very grateful to have, here, have her here tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Carolyn Jones. So much, Rachel. Where'd you go? She disappeared. Uh, anyway, that was a really lovely, lovely introduction, and it's super exciting to be here. I've had a couple of days to be in LA, and I've never seen the art scene so exciting and so vibrant. Um, it's really a very vibrant and intense scene, and I'm really enjoying my my visit. Um, I want to say something kind of off script, which is that. The Roski Lecture comes with a really nice honorarium, which is a way of respecting the work that we do, the intellectual work that we do. And, uh, you know, because Amelia is my sister, I'm contributing that honorarium to her school. I want to honor what she's doing here, and I want to honor the students that are here. So I'm trying to get the school to identify some fund for the students that my little honorarium can go into. So when I find out what that fund for the students is, I will let you know. Um, but you should hold them to it, okay? Um, if we could lower the ambient lighting, that would be super. Great, thank you so much. So I'm gonna begin my talk with a parable of autonomous art, for which Pete Mondrian's work is being made to stand as an exemplum. I can tell I'm gonna need this bottle of water that I have hidden down here. Mondrian joined a long historical struggle on behalf of art for art's sake, an art free of worn out figuration, religious iconography, or historical narrative, an art that could be understood without knowledge of myth or recourse to the artist's biography. Of course, this art would be useful in important ways as taken up by de style architects or influencing Bauhaus designs, but by 1943, when this painting was made, it was titled Broadway Boogie Woogie, bracketing off its local allusion to Manhattan's grid, it could be seen to instantiate a heroic autonomy, setting a universal standard for a purifying geometry in an emergently global modernity. To hover on the date of this painting, even for a moment, 1943, allows us to point to the obvious context for its hard-won autonomy, a world war forcing Mondrian into exile in Manhattan, 
Less obviously, 1943 marked the first group show for a new generation of very local New York artists who would contest Mondrian's geometric abstraction, aspiring instead to another kind of globalism for turbulent, symbol-laden paintings of supposedly universal myths. And there was yet a third global optic being advocated in 1943, the aerial view of military surveillance, as in the exhibition Airways for Peace, mounted by the former Bauhäusler Herbert Bayer at the Museum of Modern Art. Informing Bayer's inverted globe display was the pioneering cartographer Richard Eddies Harrison, best known for his work in Henry Luce's Fortune magazine down the street. Here, the airways vision touted by MoMA was given a Cold War gloss for the American century, whether anxiously depicting Soviet perspectives over Europe and Asia, or triumphantly evoking the vantage of the American pilot touted as the master of these skies. Could there be an aerial symbol-laden Mondrian to unite these 1943 versions of the global? Whether in the horizontality of Lego through contemporary animated fly-throughs or the overview of conservation and preservation, an aerial view of Mondrian is still an emblem of universal cultural value, purified of politics. The variant I find most suggestive for our discussion tonight is the one on the upper right, made by a student self-identified as Vietnamese, Tung Pham, for his computer animation class at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in 2010. We have indeed gone southeast to Asia, as Fortune magazine suggested. And what we discover, of course, is the presence of Asians themselves taking up the distributed universalism of autonomous art. What this opening circumnavigation illustrates is the manner in which arguments for autonomy are always entangled with social mechanisms and distribution systems, never more so than when they serve putative universalisms fueling widespread desires for the global. The shortcut art history has for this autonomy, as I've mentioned, is art for art's sake. Yet the original phrase, when it appeared in French, la pour l'art, had been formulated in the philosophy of Victor Cousin already by 1830, serving as part of the rationale for art's taxonomic insertion into the world pictures materializing during the expositions staged in Paris with great regularity beginning in 1855. These expositions allocated to art its autonomy, but only as one part of a system locking together all other human industries and occupations, the, the entire assemblage glorifying the universalist French Republic, as here in Gustave Leplay's astonishing 1867 arrangement. Autonomy is, of course, difficult to argue for, in this case, but part of my operative thesis is that it was precisely such encumbered conditions that produced the need, indeed the urgency, for the ideology of autonomy in the art world. Take Pablo Picasso's Guernica, known around the world. Like Mondrian's canvas, this one is highly recognizable and certainly modern and avant-garde, but how many recall that it was commissioned for the Spanish Republican Pavilion at the 1937 World's Fair in Paris? to be inserted once again into an operative world picture. The commissioning architect, José Louis Sert, had given Picasso carte blanche, and after the world's first aerial firebombing of civilians by the German Luftwaffe at the small Basque village of Guernica in April, the artist had his theme. But when Sert's modernist, moder modest modernist pavilion opened, both painting and building were quite literally dwarfed by the stone dragons of the competing Soviet and Nazi uh, monoliths above them. Guernica, explicitly required to negotiate with such geopolitics, cannot easily be varnished with the romance of autonomy's brush. The risks of entering a world picture are great, and Guernica failed to emerge in the overheated context of this world's fair. The only photograph I've been able to find in which the Spanish pavilion itself is even visible is this one. Sert's small modernist pavilion opened many weeks late, and despite press coverage, its contributions to the fair were largely overlooked in the shadow of those German and Soviet pavilions. The Spanish one was not even included in the official album of photolithographs, because unlike the US or Egypt, for example, its sponsoring government was just a rump state embroiled in a civil war. Thus, in order for Picasso's international strategies to unfold, 
his canvas had to get rolled up and go on tour. It went, among other places, to London in 1938, to Harvard's Fogg Museum in 1941, and in 1953 to the second edition of the New World Biennial, founded in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Guernica became the epitome of the anti-autonomous artwork. It was fully engaged in the global work of art, imbricated in specific local and global politics wherever it landed. Thoughts about autonomy need to be nuanced, however, because Guernica has always been held to carry an autonomy of content. The painting is understood to carry a pure anti-war message that nonetheless evolves. Picasso, Sert, and those who sent the painting on tour specifically aimed to rally support for the Spanish Republicans. After the end of World War II, the canvas became an emblem of leftist anti-fascism. And finally, it became a generic message promoting civilians and citizens' collective resistance to state-sponsored violence, as, for example, in protests against the Second Bush War or contemporary websites that proclaim, Gaza is our Guernica. In this ideologically constructed yet adaptable autonomy of content, Picasso's painting can be seen as autonomous as Mondrian's. This helps us theorize autonomy's global working. Rather than somehow embedded in the art itself, it is a function given to the art object so that it can emerge out of a political context and into our history. I briefly showed you the museum with its label, which is to say, in the museum. Now I'm just going back to a better resolution of this digital image. True, Mondrian's formal choices reinforce his painting's transcendental qualities. His canvas is non-objective. That is, it does not depict anything in its abstraction. Its careful brushstrokes convey impersonality, refusing the autographic gesture. Although many of the lines visually extend past the edge of the canvas, its colors do not stray from the pure primaries, red, yellow, and blue, laid down in syncopated visual rhythms. Given the painting's title, we can interpret this syncopation as a deft visual analogy to jazz dancing through the Manhattan city grid. Yet both Boogie Woogie and Broadway were ignored in the early readings of this painting in 1943. As I argued in my last book, the most important mid-century critic writing in America, Clement Greenberg, decided that Mondrian's work was a beacon of technocratic universal modernism, and in that very autonomy became morally capable of repairing, quote, the decor of the man-made world, what of it we see, move in, and handle, unquote. This global formula favored cool, hard-edged, non-objective abstraction, celebrated through the art historical method of formalism, and built into Greenberg's very apartment, as we see in this 1967 photograph taken for Vogue magazine, where this epistemic configuration could be recommended to the international readership of Condé Nast, when they weren't, of course, reading Fortune. For someone in my generation, formalism was intellectually thrilling, but it failed to capture the gritty agency of art in the world. Formalism ignored both the problem society was asking art to solve and the problematic world pictures in which these objects were being situated throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. The path of encumbrance of viewers and artists grappling with world pictures, of producers leveraging art's autonomy for other forms of agency was part of art's history that I wanted to think about. Picasso willingly inserted his work into Serret's desperate propaganda machine made for Spaniards by a Spaniard. But at the same time, let us recall how he equipped this portable mural with candy strategies of Western universalism. Let's look closely at these strategies since they gloss over the particularities of the German airstrike on a small Basque village to produce, I suggest, something we can call a global work of art. The first strategy is Picasso's grayed out palette, mimicking documentary newsprint and news photography, but in generic and illegible ways. Second, Picasso crafts his figures to allude to a classical past with fallen warriors and wounded horses rather than burn victims of the German Luftwaffe. Third, the artist's overall narrative emphasizes the bombing's impact on women and children rather than Republican militiamen, with the whole anchored by a pyramidal composition that dates back to the Renaissance, nested within, allusion, within allusions to the medieval triptych. Finally, Picasso's strategies of Western universalism include the iconography of barbarity versus enlightenment, 
slightly updated from a torch to a light bulb, the lone signifier of modernity in the painted mural. Guernica then was made as a consciously worldly painting, for the West, of course, that wielded universalism to smooth over local difference. It rendered a particular Basque town generic in order to propagate globally and avoided placement in a nation for 40 years. To me, it is crucial that such tactics were instigated for and propelled outward by a world's fair. This allows me to state the central argument of this talk tonight explicitly. The fair system structured a set of imperatives to which artists had to adjust. World's fairs and biennials produce new subjects for art, prompting new tactics by artists who aspire to globality. It is this history of worldly entanglement, of engagement despite claims to autonomy, and of the working of art that I aim to tell. The overall project of the larger book of which this research forms a part constitutes a history from the present, driven by a contemporary art world that often denies that history. This art world is saturated with biennials. Their artworks often deeply woven into specific sites or explicitly non-autonomous, invoking politics, the body, and alternative sensory paths. Contemporary artists who tend to show in these biennial venues join their activated viewers in pursuing a set of practices I call, for shorthand's sake, biennial culture. How do we get from modern, modernism's portable objects to a world of entangled relational and, and embodied aesthetics? I argue for a deeper past undergirding this present, and my arguments entail their own method. Not as pure as formalism, my toolkit builds from close readings to ask after internal dynamics, global forces, local receptions, embodied experiences, and transformed subjects. What in Sai Kuo Gong's cultural melting bath on the right calls to earlier histories of tourism and exotic entertainment in the world's fairs? How in Mariko Mori's brainwave alteration pod, wave UFO, on the left, are the technological wonders of the 19th century's hall of machines extended and personalized? When does embodiment cut against the virtual, as in the lush and sensual imagery of Pipilati Wrist, projected onto the ceiling of the 16th century Venetian church that we observe from comfy lounge beds below. Biennial culture's increasingly global art world of temporary event-driven art experiences are theorized by the likes of sociologist and curator Nicolas Bourriot to constitute a new episteme, where situational and relational aesthetics have transformed our very understanding of the way art works. As an historian, I want to interrogate such claims to newness and sudden change. I want to understand the debt we bear to centuries of world picturing spectacles and practices in promoting such an aesthetics of experience. Like the world's fairs and biennials of the past, the contemporary art world engages with tourism, play, ephemerality, and the art market, worldly attributes that make art history uncomfortable. But the fairs also provoked viewers' self-improving education, critical reflection, and cultural transformation, sometimes providing a powerful platform for art to conduct politics by other means. Thus, I believe we need to grapple with the challenges and synergies of this art world, or we're not doing proper art history. We need to ask why visitors come to these recurring exhibitions in the first place, and why they're not content with what can be seen in museums or conventional art galleries, but seek in the biennial experience and immersion. Now, these developments can, of course, be connected to the experience economy first theorized by German sociologist Gerhard Schulze in 1992 and announced as a celebratory project by Harvard Business Review uh, scholars Joseph Pine and James Gilmore in 1998. But this, too, has a longer history. Even as the Grand Tour was democratized by London's first great exhibition, Thomas Cook was stimulated to invent the world's first package tour. Fairs drove urban infrastructures, becoming aspects of the city brandscapes that would later be advocated by architect Anna Klingman in 2007 as part of the experience economy. News that a Shanghai real estate firm will soon begin rebuilding the Crystal Palace in London confirms this simulacral trajectory. My colleagues in the fields of art and architectural history have tended to address the situation with understandable melancholy, not to say monochrome, in books of critical reflection, such as Pam Lee's Forgetting the Art World or David Joslett's After Art, I notice the iconoclastic covers. 
These and other scholars are grappling with globalization, but sometimes with the desire to reestablish autonomy as the precondition for artistic agency or the defending protector of artistic freedom. I argue from history that autonomy is a hard-won product of entanglement. <coughs> Moreover, I claim that entanglement with world pictures is an important precondition for a critically global working of art. The longer history I'm advocating needs exploring in granular detail, while somehow also keeping track of the bird's eye view that these world pictures consistently elicit. Through the critical parallax of different scales and comparative histories, it becomes clear that these event-driven modes of engaging the viewer were one place that autonomy became a value. In the first place, partnered by professionalization of the art market and, of course, of art history itself. Artistic strategies of specialized address were forged in the crucible of affairs, woven into the world picture done by expositions, and stimulating artists' urgent responses. Consider briefly the juxtaposition you have before you. A cartographer's imagined bird's eye view of the 1867 World Exposition in Paris, and a canvas depicting that very event by the modernist Edouard Manet. Manet, excluded from the official Beaux-Arts exhibition at this ex exposition, mimicked Gustave Courbet's tactic from the previous Paris World's Fair, and borrowed money to set up his own pavilion. Aiming at the fair's 15 million visitors, he painted a few of them in this canvas. His painting ignores the fair's official taxonomies to produce its own universal exposition of the human types on display in Paris during the fair, reinforcing artistic tropes of the cosmopolitan center where all the world comes to see and be seen. What is the demographic that Manet brings out of the bird's eye view and into ours? The population here includes an immigrant worker maintaining the newly planted fairgrounds, a plump bourgeois lady next to a cocodut with her chaperone in black, two British country tourists gawking at Nadar's globe-shaped hot air balloon, an Amazon or liberated woman on her horse, two Parisian gentlemen, three off-duty imperial guardsmen, and even Manet's own son, Leon, promenading with the scruffy family dog. It's practically the 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> Exemplary historians such as Pat Menardi and T.J. Clark have noted the painting's odd disjunctions and manifestly unfinished qualities, testaments to the fragmentary gaze of a distracted modernity. But what interests me more is how this art worked as part of Manet's tactics to solicit the gaze and create a public for himself, a public in the world and not just provincial Paris. The International Fair offered him a platform from which to offer an alternative to the conservatism of his local academy and cultural establishments. As the artist himself put it in a pamphlet he had printed for visitors, to exhibit is the vital issue, the sine qua non for the artist. For it so happens after several confrontations that one becomes familiar with what had been surprising, and if you will, shocking. Little by little, one understands and accepts it. To exhibit is to find friends and allies for the struggle. It was a challenge, but also the only way to proceed if you had desires for the global. And I suggest that such tactics are connected to those taken by artists today. Is the struggle Manet describes one of formal innovation only? Or as in the Cypriot expat Hussein Chalayan's 2005 <coughs> video installation for the nation of Turkey at the Venice Biennale, might such strategies of insertion use the tiny Archimedean lever of art to shift discourse to another level? Chilayan's theme was the polyglot diversity of humanity, a theme that resonated in the wider context of a European vote on Turkey joining the EU in a post-9-11 world. If fairs and biennials conduct politics by other means, then can art be seen to work its own kind of agency in that assemblage, earning its autonomy and freedom to speak? Such questions drive my larger book's project, The Global Work of Art. I've shortened the title. I don't know, it just got too complicated. So it's The Global Work of Art. Mm -hmm. Crowded into this slide are images spanning the history I've researched, from the 19th century World's Fairs, here exemplified by geographer Elisée Recluse's terrestrial globe at the 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris, 
to the 21st century artist Mona Hatoum with her glowing sculpture Hot Spots at the 2007 Sharjah Biennial. In the history I'm exploring, the biennial format developed by Venice in 1895 forms a crux or midpoint. The city positioning itself to refuse the exhausted encyclopedic impulse of the northern European fairs with a recurring, perpetually renewing, trade-specific art fair that was also a branding strategy for a cosmopolitan city far older than its nation. This brilliant urban intervention was copied first by Sao Paulo, transplanting the biennial format to a new world and a Cold War. After the Brazilian intervention, Biennale proliferated around the world. The sheer number of these recurring exhibitions is astounding. They can't actually easily be counted. To give you a sense, I want to play this animation created by a young curator from Eastern Europe, Rafael Nemajewski. The growth of biennials uh, has graphed, he graphed here through 2007, parallels population growth, but is much more indicative, I suggest, of the spreading nodes of networked globalization itself. Such a situation requires a structural taxonomic understanding rather than a nominative history. In other words, I'm not going to go through this book telling you about every biennial that's ever occurred. The stakes of my project, then, are to craft a synoptic history accompanied by case studies and close readings that can explore our desires for world pictures and interrogate the global subjects they aim to produce. At the center of this talk, let me then delve into a specific case study that will allow me to articulate some of the book's theses, which drive a primary goal of restoring work to its function as a verb. Although not as sexy as Monet or Picasso, the painter Joseph Israels provides a perfect case study. His career began with the first fair to have had a fine arts pavilion in 1855 and ends shortly after the founding of the Venice Biennale. Crucially for my argument, Israels goes down into the French-dominated canon of art history and of 19th century European art as the Dutch Millet, a configuration I have dubbed predicated internationalism, which has many avatars. Perhaps we can get to those in the Q&A. So the major theses of my book begin with the philosophical. Making sense of these massive display machines requires what I call blind epistemology. Set up philosophically by Plato, Descartes, Diderot, the trope of blindness recurs among Western critics of the European fairs from Henry Adams to Marcel Duchamp, who turn away from the rows of objects and columns of text to become sensory investigators, tapping through the archives and cabinets of artifacts to conduct what Goethe described as tender empiricism. The pen in Henry Adams' simile serving as a blind man's staff, the ready-made in Duchamp promoting an anti-retinal art. The second thesis is historical and argues that the fairs over time enforce certain rules of the game. Players, that is, artists, must speak the international language, but are constrained to speak of difference, usually their own. The best artists become strategists of this condition. They anticipate that knowledge is plural and that one aspect will appear salient within the international art world while another will communicate to the artist's culture of origin. These, taxi, these tactics evolve over time and must be worked out by each artist entering the melee at a given historical moment. The case of Joseph Israel's leapt out at me from the European archives as exemplary of these mechanisms. Becoming international in 1855 at that Paris World's Fair, Israel's was appointed to the founding committee of the Venice Biennale in 1865 and then awarded a gold medal for lifetime achievement at the 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris. His entire career is thus bracketed by the phenomenon I'm attempting to historicize. <coughs> With a name that marked his difference from Christian Europe, Israels was born in Groningen to a family of traders who kept ties to their relatives in Germany, but blossomed in their adopted, in their adopted Dutch country, founding a synagogue, a mikveh, and a cemetery. Resisting his father's calls to become a businessman, where he learned as, uh, is, young Israels passed the state exams for the Royal Art Academy in Antwerp, in Amsterdam, sorry, where he learned a smooth, polished history painting style under Jan Willem Pienemann, and here we see Pienemann's 1824 painting of a triumphant Wellington presiding over the defeat of Napoleon. Israels was encouraged by teachers such as Pienemann to go to the true center of the 19th century art world, 
namely Paris in 1844, where he studied with academician François-Édouard Picot, who brought the French standard of the nude into Israel's repertoire. Cutting this transfer of skills short, the 1848 revolution drove Israel's back to Amsterdam. He continued history painting, dipping back into Paris when it was safe to do so, on one occasion visiting with famous Dutch expatriate Ari Scheffer, who was then at the end of his career. By now, your eyes should be swimming with the well-modeled flesh of academic painting. This cluttered view of Israel's artistic biography becomes simpler when we narrow our focus to the painting constituting his masterpiece, that is, the medieval moment when he graduates from the apprentice student to the master of the guild, uh, his negotiation with the world picture in 1855, namely this painting that I started with, an academic history painting, William of Orange, meeting with Margareta of Parma, a painting that was still in progress when it was selected for inclusion in the Dutch section of the first French World's Fair. The 1855 Parisian Fair departed from its British model, the Great Exhibition, by featuring for the first time a display dedicated entirely to the fine arts, which the French considered themselves, of course, specialists in. The stakes could not have been higher for a young foreigner entering this brand new international venue. Israel's earnest attempt is, frankly, overworked and lugubrious. But we can see the operative standards well enough. Remember the unspoken rules of the game as I've articulated them. The artwork should speak the international language here, academic history painting, but should use it to speak of difference. In this case, the history of the Netherlands. The event being shown is a 16th century meeting between William of Orange, the Protestant-born, Catholic-raised favorite of Charles V, and Margaretha of Parma, regent of the Netherlands and half-sister to the Habsburg Emperor Philip II. Don't worry, you don't have to really know this. Although she was Philip's designated ruler in the Low Countries, the important point of this history was that Margaretta had no army. Hence, she was utterly dependent on William, Prince William, the ruling stadtholder and spokesman for the local noblemen and their militias. <coughs> the frozen moment the tableau records is April 1565, when Margareta was presented with a petition from the noblemen demanding an end to the Spanish prosecution of local Protestants, i.e. the Inquisition. As Israel wrote to a friend, this moment seemed, quote, really interesting as a subject to represent his, quote, fatherland, because William was so secretive that for many, no one knew how he was taking the advice from the open council chosen by the party of the people, until with a single gesture, he declined to follow the edicts of Philip, end quote. With a foot in the two warring Christian faiths, that is, Protestantism and Catholicism during the wars of religion, William represents reason and tolerance for Israel. His raised hand makes a commanding gesture of restraint that can also be read as a blessing or a promise of grace. A grid placed over the picture reveals the explicit hierarchies. Margareta and her courtiers are linked in indecision, while William commands them from above, supported warily by the diplomat to our left and more courageously by the soldier on the right. The Catholic Margareta sits forward in her almost liturgical throne, swathed in the fabrics of court luxury, while William stands calmly in Protestant black under a frame of neoclassical architecture, his posture conveying rhetorical power and Ciceronian restraint. Now, it's important to note that the orange William in Israel's painting is not the warrior he would become. Thrown into martyrdom by a French Catholic assassin, the first political killing in human history to be accomplished with a gun. What Israel's and the curator of the Dutch section who visited his studio in 1854 seemed to have wanted to put into the world picture was thus quite specific. It is a moment in history that might remind the French, who by now have another Napoleon in charge, that tolerance and pacifism are Dutch contributions to enlightenment, emblems of ground level politics and secular coexistence lobbed into Catholic imperial France. Israel's must have swelled with excitement as he imagined this painting being viewed by thoughtful men in the world, his art offering a contemplative lesson, an alternative to the minstrelry of nations and sequestered from the gaudy commercial attractions at the larger um, exposition. 
But it, what interests me more is what he saw when he actually came to Paris to view his painting inside that Beaux-Arts uh, exposition. As he entered the separate pavilion at the 1855 exposition where art was sequestered, he would have seen something like this, a dense hanging, familiar from the seasonal Paris salons, recorded in one of the world's first installation photographs. Note the shadowy ladders. Photographic emulsions were so slow at the time that the moving workmen leave no trace on the negative, but their ladder does. In this setup, French artists were in the main galleries, les étrangers, somewhere in the back. Apparently, the Dutch didn't fare too well in the implied contest. One historian reporting that reviews were, quote, not good for the Dutch entry and for history painting as practiced by Israel's. And the painter himself later recalled being dismayed when he saw his canvas in Paris, writing a friend, quote, I regret that the tableau had not gotten better, end quote. Israel's was impressed all over again by the academician Thomas Couture's Romans of Decadence, a canvas that was already eight, eight years old but still dominating the French section with its admonitory judgment on imperial excess. As photographs show, the interior of the French section was stuffed from top to bottom with the eclectic fruits of the academic Beaux-Arts tradition, ranging from icy old Angre to Rosa Bonneau's prize-winning earthy haymaking. But all of this came to seem completely irrelevant because outside the Beaux-Arts building itself, was the ambitious realist pavilion mounted by the soon to be a communard, Gustave Courbet, right down the street and on every artist's lips. The sheer audacity of mounting your own pavilion, seemingly in confrontation with the state apparatus of an entire world picture, certainly contributed to Courbet's success. But it's important to note that his enterprise was not opposed by the state. The pavilion's location alone at 7 Avenue Montaigne suggests its semi-official status. It was de facto endorsed by Napoleon III as a way of currying populist sentiment while snubbing the elitist academy. Paralleling this endorsement, Courbet offered a flattering portrait of the self-appointed emperor, depicting him as a huntsman within the monumental painting of the artist's studio installed as the centerpiece of the realist pavilion. We have to imagine paintings like this and the accompanying realist manifesto hitting the young Israels like a slap in the face or perhaps a kick in the butt. A paradoxical fusion of academic allegory, contemporary politics, and everyday being. With no great moments of history, no clear narrative, no academic brush strokes, and only this shadowy pictorial, pasty, crusty kind of painting to knit these murky contemporary figures together in a tableau, of course, dedicated to the individual artistic genius at work. The clarion call of Courbet's realist manifesto, not necessarily realistic. As Linda Nochlin and Meyer Shapiro have explored in their classic histories of this moment, Courbet's monumentalization of vulgarity was prof profoundly was proudly explicit in this and other paintings in his pavilion, with the artist alluding to cheap broadsides of, for example, the wandering Jew as a figure for his own self-identity as a nomadic prophet confronting the urban bourgeoisie uh, with their settled ways. How much of this was known to Israel's is unclear, but certainly he would have grasped the pavilion's polemical function. The style of realism that had been appropriated from literature as the new model for visual art, the shocking new mode of featuring regular people from the present day as the subject matter for monumental painting, dominated, of course, by the artist's self-fabricated genius. The style's supposed ugliness was perceived at the time as both political and populist in the wake of the failed 1848 revolution. The radical Victorian lessons in the realist pavilion included turning away from the city with its erudition and intellectualism, its classical references, its academic criteria, to depict those left behind by industrialization, anonymized by its displacements. These new subjects were applauded by socialists such as Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who commented, Courbet's painting is an irony directed against our industrialized civilization, with its, which is incapable of freeing man from the heaviest, most difficult, and most unpleasant tasks the eternal lot of the poor, end quote. 
perhaps most salient to the young Israels was that in order to depict these humble workers, Courbet had turned to nothing other than Dutch 17th century genre paintings with a new crusty materiality that reinvented them for visceral modernity. Courbet's temporary pavilion would have upended everything that Israel's Dutch masters had thought important. They had valued history and classical reference, polished with skill, erudition, and varnish, notions they'd imported from the French Academy itself. In reckoning with Courbet, Israel's would have to go back to the old demonic language of Netherlandish genre painting, a tradition, of course, that was never his. Enlarged to a massive scale, and anonymized into hieratic universality. This was asking a lot. The histories of Israel's life recount that upon his return to the Netherlands from the exposition, he plunged into crisis. This crisis could be resolved only by becoming blind to the fair itself, becoming blind to academic painting, in order to see with fresh eyes the force of Courbet's stunning new imperative <coughs> The resolution for Israel's is immediately evident in works that he painted thereafter, such as Alongside the Cemetery from 1856, a genre painting of the seaside proletariat monumentalized to tragic proportions. The tale of Israel's crisis and transformation threads through the literature, what literature there is, that is, nicely reinforcing Western tropes of artistic development that have endured in our history since Vasari's Lives of the Artist in the 16th century. Thus we read in the first biennial catalog in Venice, uh, four decades after this painting, that the young provincial Israels learned the falsita della sua agitazione by going to cosmopolitan Paris. After confronting this falsity in his education, he is said to have fallen dangerously ill, taking himself for a rest cure to the North Sea coast in Zandvoort, about 10 miles from Amsterdam. Here, turning from urbanity, just like Courbet, he made the studies that were later summarized in a painting like this, a totem of Israel's new faith in the facture and politics of international realism. Zandvoort was perfect for this transformative alchemy, offering Israel's a sharp contrast between the humble fisherfolk who lived there and the fashionable tourists who had begun flocking to the developing bathing resort from urban Amsterdam. In this context, the artist split the difference between Courbet's striding self-portrait and the humble toiling father and son of his stonebreakers, who were now given a baby and a religion, all situated amidst the particular scenography of the Dutch coast. The new mode became so successful that Israel's is now best known for these scenes of humble fisher folk, including another tableau about death that would win accolades in the London art world um, during the World's Fair of 1862, becoming a celebrated acquisition at Britain's National Gallery of Art. Here, the comparison would be not to Courbet's meeting, but to another painting from the 1855 Pavilion du Realisme, the vast burial at Ordon, with its horizontal frieze of figures merging with the landscape and grappling with death. These homologies with Courbet go really unmentioned in the literature. It's quite perplexing. Recall that it was Israel's fate to become not the Dutch Courbet, but the Dutch Mier. Why this linkage? The short answer is that Jean-Francois Mier offered a better market. Mier was avowedly a realist, but one highly palatable to the world market and acceptable to the French state. Casual globe-trotting collectors were bewildered by Courbet's strange pictures and radical politics. Millet was more easily comprehended. Interestingly, many of Millet's early adopters came from the US, led by Boston artist William Morris Hunt, who purchased Millet's more difficult early painting, The Sower, <coughs> which was already in Boston by 1851, painted and collected before the great exhibitions had even begun. Once Millet entered those world's fairs, his gaze softened, and he began to emphasize his affiliation with the palatable tradition of Netherlandish genre paintings, rather than the socialist sympathies evident in Sower, a shift that further increased his appeal for the world's collectors. In this more tepid later realism, honesty, warmth, and directness were still valued above academic arts polish, but brushstrokes 
would be smaller, contrasts would be softened, and color shifted to the rosy end of the spectrum. If Millet would learn to anonymize labor from Courbet, he would also domesticate it. Courbet became a communard committed to the urban proletariat. Millet painted the rural poor in ways that could reinforce Jesus' message, the poor you shall always have with you. Biblical allusions were certainly available in Millet's one entry to that 1855 exposition where Israel's painting was also on view. Following a thorough state evaluation of his political background in 1852, Millet had been pre-approved for the important venue of the fair. The painting he submitted is a veritable holy family. As one historian described it, for peasant grafting a tree exhibited in the World's Fair of 1855, Millet tempered his usual brutal realism, perhaps in response to government pressure to display non-controversial themes for an international audience. Millet's friend Sancier occupied a key post in the Ministry of the Interior and regularly mediated between the government of Napoleon III and the painter. This, then, was Millet the conciliatory Barbizon realist rather than the brutal portraitist of the poor, the marketable French artist to whom the Dutch-dwelling Israels would be so consistently compared, a predicated internationalism that Israels himself seemed to, decide, seemed to desire. Or at least this is the implication of the anecdote reported by Max Lieberman, a young secessionist writing of his old friend in Holland in 1901. Israels once said to me, no painter except Millet has been less able to draw and paint than I, and yet made such good pictures. In other words, said Lieberman, like Millet, Israels is not a man of talent, but of genius. Cottage, Cottage Madonna, I propose, uh, confirms that this was a genius of place, genius loci, honoring the tutelary god of Christian Dutchness. What I want to emphasize here is that a painter such as Israel's, beneficiary of Europe's tenuously secular enlightenment, a talented underling enabled by bureaucracies of the state to find his way into international expositions, had to learn his innocence, his common touch, and his channeling of Western and largely Christian fatherland in order to enter the international fray. The world picture, in other, worlds, in other words, is hardly universal, although it is universalist in European fashion. But Israel's achieved this synthesis was confirmed by an anecdote reported by a Chicago critic in 1912. When the Archbishop of Paris saw his cottage Madonna in the 1882 Paris Salon, he said to the eminent Jew, Mr. Israels, you are a great Catholic, end quote. The critic writing is Frank Gonzalez, Chicago pastor, educator, art collector, and writer, just one of the many Midwesterners who collected Israel's work. Doubtless relayed to Gonzalez by Israels himself, the Catholic in this anecdote might best be understood as lowercase. Um, claiming uh, the kind of Western cosmopolitanism that presupposed the universalism of St. Augustine's entirely Christian city of God. Thus, Israel's worldliness is, a critical is not a critical globalism that pushes back against the forces of globalization. It is instead an emblem of the rules as they function for the 19th century artist in a spreading market that included reproductions such as these, posthumously flooding across Europe and into the US, where they landed in drifts from the industrial Midwest to the Eastern seaboard and on the internet where someone like I can buy them on eBay. The marketing of Israel's via Millet is reinforced by websites today, such as Britain's National Gallery, in which the painting uh, in, that we've been looking at is dutifully celebrated as being, quote, redolent of Millet. But despite this repetition of the trope, British critics were the ones who had historically questioned the Francophone insistence on Israel's being a Dutch Millet, as witnessed in the puzzle tone of this 1912 London art writer. Quote, to regard Israel's as being a kind of interpreter of Millet to Holland is not in accordance with the facts. Though Millet was 10 years older than Israel's, he had only just left the studio of Delaroche when the latter entered it. The year Millet pa painted the first of his great peasant pictures, The Winnower, was the very year that Israels left Paris, 
soon to come to his awakening at Zandvoort. In 1857, Israel's exhibited in the Paris Salon with two seashore pictures. In 1859, Millet's death in the woodcutter was rejected at the Salon. And here's the kicker in this quote. If we call Israel's the Dutch Millet, it must be by way of comparison, not of affiliation. And we must be at liberty to call Millet the French Israel's, end quote. But as you can imagine, I'm arguing that we are not at liberty in this way. As my case study has endeavored to show, our interpretive liberty will always be shaped by the world picturing apparatus and its nodes of power, enforcing predicated internationalism, the Dutch Millet on this painter from the periphery, because art history is being written at that point in French by a chronicler of Paris's 1900 Exposition Universelle. Now, a brief sidebar, I have another talk in which I argue that this predicated internationalism was overturned in the 60s, but one of my <coughs> audience members works at Christie's and he says, oh no, there's a Bombay Damien Hurst, and there's a Tokyo Andrea Zatel, and there, you know, so I thought it was over, but th this, this analysis is still to be made on, on the present. Okay. The point here is that Israel's, at this point in the 19th century, was completely willing to accept the rules of this game. The list of his paintings that made it into world pictures and widely distributed collections is absolutely remarkable. Evincing a success equal to any biennial artist operating today, I would argue, in its balance of market and academy, exposition and fair. If we imagine that today's biennials are guarantors of an enduring reputation in art history, the case of Israel's has another lesson to offer. A successful lifetime career in these events does not necessarily ensue, in, ensure an enduring legacy. But that would be the topic of another talk altogether. Let me approach my conclusion with a recap of the historical theses. Artists who will enter the world picture must adopt the prevailing international language and use it often to speak of their own difference. Thus, in this late self-portrait, Israel depicts himself as a contemporary European l'homme du monde, man of the world with his watch fob, bowler hat, three-piece suit, but he stands before one of his better known paintings of Old Testament themes. This one, painted in the 1890s, David before Saul. He places himself between the old king, Saul, and the young upstart, David, as if in acknowledgment of his leveraged position between one century and the next. Potentially, a given artist will be gifted enough to expand and extend a prevailing international style, perhaps even stretching it to set a new norm, or torquing it to shift the periphery to the center. A brilliant tactician might reveal the centralized style's debt to a peripheralized other, or might generalize from an enforced difference to craft a strategically universalized message. I've read Picasso's Guernica in this light. Such artistic maneuvers may require relocation to a center, however. Israel's wasn't willing to move to Paris, and accepted terms Picasso would later refuse. For these very reasons, he can exemplify for us normal art in its global distributed working, along the lines of what Thomas Kuhn so dis devastatingly called normal science in 1962. But in his small way, Israel's did keep alive for Dutch artists themselves the validity of their own tradition, embedded in international practice and rediscovered via Courbet and Millet, who brought it back to salience in the theater of the World's Fair so that it could circulate into contemporaneity through the work of the much younger Dutchman, Vincent van Gogh, who obediently described Israel's in a letter to his brother Theo as the Dutch Mier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm even tempted to see a dim echo of Israel's peripheral themes surviving to occupy the center of Picasso's Guernica, where the dark background and primitive interior lighting alludes via van Gogh to the peaceful comforts of home and interiority the domestic virtues of genre painting violently ruptured by 20th century industrialized world war. So the assertions I began with organized my conclusion. 
and will bring us back to the present. I'm claiming that the structural circumstances of art artists' insertions into recurring world picturing exhibitions have a history stretching the length and breadth of modernity. The venues for world pictures reveal this stretch, moving from purpose-built temples and fairgrounds to emptied industrial structures that were themselves part of modern capital's expansion and circulation, now repurposed for post-industrial urban development in the experience economy, which I think we just heard <laughs> eavesdropping outside the gallery. Um, likewise, the media suffusing our world pictures have changed, but maintain common goals of salience despite a dramatic shift from the once stable typologies of sculpture, paint, and paper to the more open-ended media of video, installation, performance, constructed situations, internet memes, and so on, also designed to produce experience in the contemporary subject. But part of the reason for this work is to ask whether the tropes identified in the earlier world pictures have changed, and if so, how? Visitors today may be invited to enter size cultural melting bath rather than look at a picture or sculpture, but one has to ask at the marks of difference being represented or ostentatiously dissolved. Experience, which once included taking, once included taking a bone-rattling trip to see an exposition with the promise of a cup of imported tea at its end, may now be bundled into a total sensory package at the biennial itself via literal immersion in a diasporal Chinese artist's bath of steaming medicinal herbs. In the final analysis, I want to hold off the collapse of all expositionary art into a late capitalist experience economy. Rather utopianly, I insist on desires, for example, a word that allows me to acknowledge both the murmur of the crowd in contemporary discourse formation and my own debt to feminism and Foucault. Pluralizing the term makes a further nod in the direction of the polyvocality we know is hiding behind the universal. What about the multiplied world pictures that are summoned by these current desires for the global? Are they merely instruments of the state entities, municipal boosters, and diffuse NGOs that propel world's fairs and drive biennial culture today? Given the philosophical heft that world pictures has from Martin Heidegger, the concept of the Weltbild has its own history that precedes this philosopher and a more diffuse existence after him. Heidegger's world picture was a singular affair, marking an epistemic break between a prelapsarian world and a modern tyranny of representations. I argue that Heidegger's vision of a singular epoch in which a world picture becomes possible is itself epistemically fueled by the world pictures authored by Empire in the fairs. Significantly, he crafted the world picture essay in, to be delivered at the 1937 Paris World's Fair. In the end, the Nazis chose a better apparatchik, but that was the context for that essay. I can only allude to this argument today, but let me just remind you that Heidegger not only converted Wilhelm Dilthe's Weltanschau into an external Weltbild, but made a restrictive interpretation of Dilthe's turn-of-the-century concept of Erlebnis, a lived experience meant to resist what Dilthe called ocularism in favor of the openness of being, even amidst the onslaught of modernity. This openness is the world-picturing activity I want to revive from Dilthe, restoring it from Heidegger's restrictions adding erfahrung, or the accumulated experience after reflection, to the being that art becomes. As a simple example of how I want to use these concepts of experience and hold off the experience economy, uh, let us take the artist Willem Boschoff's Blind Alphabet, which was first displayed at the Johannesburg Biennial and immediately taken to the Sao Paulo Biennial. Briefly, the work exhibits the polyvocality I've been advocating. The sighted visitor sees only an arrangement of minimalist boxes, which in standard art museum decorum, they may not touch. By contrast, the blind visitor is allowed to lift the box covers, read the braille explanations within, and touch the sculptures inside. These blind users are then encouraged, if they are willing, to serve as translators for the benighted art world visitors um, excluded from touching these works. 
For Boshoff, a sighted Afrikaans artist in South Africa, this bifurcating of the audience via alphabets had a richly linguistic set of meanings. Yet, when installed at the Sao Paulo Biennial, this work became a vehicle for colorblind interpretations with anti-racist implications. For my thesis, excuse me, for my thesis on blind epistemologies, the sculptural installation has yet another set of world picturing possibilities, culminating in a politics of the partial view. This returns us to the concept of the work of art, my ultimate goal in this project. Now, work is a noun in any parsing of my title, but in place of a reified thing, I want to insist on the kind of gerundive force, the working of art, in its various distributed contexts and its distribution over time. A contemporary artist such as Boshoff or the London-grown Berlin-based Tino Segal uh, becomes productive for me to think through art's working. As Segal's key interpreter, Dorothea von Hantelman, puts it, glossing J.L. Austin's speech act theory, this is how you do things with art. I analyzed Segal's work KISS as it was installed in the 2006 Berlin Biennial, where it unfolded in a mirror-studded dance hall on Auguststrasse, a constructed situation continuously refreshed by a changing pair of interpreters who switched gender roles in the middle of their choreographed loops. The artist's injunction against official photography does not prevent images like these from circulating on Tumblr, but it does enforce the artist's position that static imagery is not a placeholder for the work of art, much less a collectible vestige of it. For me, experiencing KISS in that Berlin Biennial was particularly intense, an intensity that sharpened during the choreographed moment when the performers turn to look around the room and make eye contact with every viewer. This Brechtian rupture added to the redolent sight to produce all kinds of reflections, and the pun, of course, is intentional. Uh, scopophilic and, and voyeuristic, the eroticism of ballroom dancing, the role of desire in the German Republic uh, and in fascism to come, sex in the militarized Third Reich, and of all the above in the present day democracy <coughs> struggling uh, to hold in Berlin today. In still later reflection, this break with the spectatorial autonomy of the performers helped me understand the role of the event in contemporary biennial culture and in the sort of philosophical understanding of being itself. There is a late essay by Michel Foucault, which I found particularly helpful, recently brought to my attention by Martin Jay, in which the French philosopher looks back at his own development and his own writing and sees experience as that which could cut into the fabric of ignorance and complacency and help him to think the unthought. Foucault charged experience with the task of tearing the subject from itself in such a way that it is no longer the subject as such, or that it is completely other than itself. It is this desubjectifying undertaking, the idea of a limit experience that tears the subject from itself, which is the fundamental lesson." End quote. That lesson fails to teach unless those ruptures can be sutured into some kind of functional continuity, whether that be in a single self or a global community. This is how I want the global to function for us, as an ever-shifting platform for debates about situated experiences shared in a polyvocal project of knowledge production through the representational theater of art. That this kind of experience is potentially disorienting contributes to the politics I intend by focusing on desires for the world picture and for the global working of art. Thank you. Love questions. There's still time to change my argument, so. I guess I win. I mean, <laughs> yes. Thanks for this uh, incredibly rich talk. I have hey, a, a not, not really a, a very vague question. That's good. But at least he's talking about me for a minute. Um, in looking at this 
painting example that's in the pre 1960s. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if you could speculate or riff on what I'm thinking of as, as sentiment, the question of sentiment in this global picture or world picture. Um, and I'm, I, I'm not really thinking about affect so much as really the sentimental. There's some way in which, you know, uh, uh, Mule, Israel's, even Garanta, yeah, yeah. I think I'm quite right, um, make an appeal to a kind of banal feel, right? Sentiment. Right. Um, and I'm wondering how that might play into this, this notion that you're trying to develop about a particular picture genre. Right. I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I recently gave a version of this talk in Chicago, and David Getze said, you know, what about affect? This makes me so sad. Do you care about that? <laughs> um, so there, there, there's, something, there's something there. Um, I am rooting for Israel's. And, you know, he's trading this, this, this academic machinery for something much more intimate. And I think you're right. I think he's just, we could say, if we wanted to criticize him, we'd say he was pandering to sentiment. If we wanted to praise him, we would say he was calling to the universal human condition and its sentiment, you know? He was, he was offering an education sentimental. You know, he was, he was trying to get us to come with him to this universal, you know, place of the modest home, domestic, you know, the poor fisherman, what's he going to do with his dead wife and his three children, he has two children. Um, so that's, that's a very interesting observation, and um, I don't know quite what to do with it, but it's really interesting. And it might be that you could track the technologies of the self if you want to take a Foucauldian approach and simply ask how the art is using affect to produce a particular kind of subject through a claim to an international language of the visual. You know, I mean, you could, you could, you could frame it that way. It would be, it would be very, very interesting. Um, and, I, and I agree that I think, I think Guernica's right in there. Um, Guernica is, you know, an inexhaustible work and yet it's a pandering, you know, it, 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 it actually takes surrealism and, and banalizes it to be about the actual violence to bodies rather than some sort of like psychic, you know, detournement. So it's, it's Picasso's own self-vulgarization and it's a really interesting move that he's making there to become public um, through surrealism. Um, you know, it's right up there with Dali and, and, and sort of Madison Avenue you know, and how it wants to use surrealism. Uh, and that, that, is, that is super interesting. So thank you for that question. I have no idea if I answered it or even articulated it correctly, but, um, but that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. And, and if, if I was to sort of update it, I think for me, the, the contemporary artworks that I want to think with um, produce an affect of profound disorientation, uh, sometimes shame, sometimes embarrassment. Um, Sometimes a kind of like exhilarated, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm looking at this. Is anyone looking at me looking at this, right? I mean, that whole complex is, I think, where the best work puts me, and I use best only in my own experience, only as something that I just can't stop thinking about, something that just bugs me. Um, and as for the Segal, you know, I have to lay my interpretation to rest in this book, but you know, I just saw the, quote, same piece at Martin Gropius in utter blackness with naked people. And so is it the same piece? Uh, am I the difference? I mean, you know, like, what was that, right? So I'm, I'm going to have to keep thinking, but whatever. Book, book, has to, book has to be done. But thank you very much for that question. Yes. Um, thank you. That was really uh, thought provoking, and um, I found myself thinking through. And I don't know if this would be a useful comment slash not quite formulated question, but um, 
I think partly because there was so much in, in this talk about realism. Yeah. I found my think, myself thinking about some of Jameson's work on realism. And I think some of his more recent stuff. Um, but, you know, this, I think, like, it's not just him, but it's just, you know, the sense that within, you know, 19th century realism, and sort of the big, you know, and this is, I'm thinking coming at this from more from the literary angle. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, you know, that you, off, that you see in these novels this attempt to, figure capital, but it's it's an unknowable force, right? That it appears kind of on the edges of, it's like the infrastructure of the story, but something that you can't quite see, right? right? And, um, and and so I think I found myself kind of turning to that in relationship to the way that you're, you're talking about, like the, you're using the word that, or the idea of the global um, in your work. And, you know, is that, is it to, is it, um, you know, like just in terms of thinking, like what kind of legibility does the global have um, um, in and around the works that you're looking at? The hidden at? hand. What? The hidden yeah, hand. Yeah, it's like global. Yeah. So. Um, so, totally formed by Jameson in my, you know, like coming up. But I think I depart from him. I'd say I, I share his desire for a, a, mo a mobile force of. of you know, art and the creative as surfacing the things we have to think about. Um, but I think I see it on a more phenomenological level, and um, it, it does need to be critical, but it might start being critical through our very own disordered self, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, and back to realisms, one of the things that I find fascinating about that moment in my ignorance of literary theory, is how the writers are completely problematizing representation itself. You know, so, you know, Flaubert is saying, you, reader, are just sitting comfortably by the fire, and you think this has nothing to do with you, but this is a real story about real people in their crumbling huts, you know, in their poverty, you know. And it's like, wait a minute, this is a novel, so they're not real. But you just made me aware of the fact that I am real, but maybe I'm not real, because you just wrote about me too, right? So it's this, it's that, it's that feature of literary realism, which I think is so powerful in what I meant by realism is not realistic, right? I mean, it, it, you know, and this is just something I have to teach my undergraduates. You know, realism is not realistic, you know. Um, so I think Israel's was kind of, you know, clever enough or centralized enough to those debates and those issues to be able to use that. Okay. So, you know. I think I might have, can I, do you mind if I rephrase my question? Yes. Now, as you've been talking, it's been yes. helping me to okay. kind of um, articulate uh, to myself. I think the question is like, um, is, it the, is it the global or the market or are they the same? Right, like, because I mean, a lot of what we're seeing with Israel is, in, in the story that he presented, which I love, um, you know, it's him being moved by this contact with realism, but then that also being mediated by market. Right. There's a you know real kind of materialist history. Absolutely. So the development of the style. So great question. The market capital M, right? I mean, yeah. it's got to be there in this story. But interestingly, he could have a market if he was an academic painter, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of this is a story about cultural capital. Mm -hmm. It's about whose opinion you care about. It's about how to be um, with those cool people over there that seem to be cosmopolitan. Right. Right. What is that language? What, what are they talking about? Can I, can I speak that language? What is that language, right? Um, and, and that is the thing that interests me in the 19th century when I can find that. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 20th century, what I start to observe is what I call critical globalism. And this is my chance to proselytize for some terminology. So art historians got kind of clever about saying, well, you have modernization, and then you have modernism. And modernism is what the artists are doing and theorizing about that. But we've gotten really, really messy about global, right? So I want to say globalization is that bad stuff that's happening in neoliberal lay capital. And then there's globalism, which is a field of representation that the artist can enter and wield and think about and critically reflect by. You know, so I've had to add the word critical so that it's like kind of helps people understand what I mean. So I argue that critical globalism is an artistic tactic. 
for making us precisely aware of this kind of situating. So, um, you know, I do have opinions, and they, they tend to start to pile up towards the end of the book where it comes more and more you know, to the present. Um, but I think a part of me just is holding on to a utopian space that doesn't completely collapse into the experience economy, and um, I'm not throwing up my hands, and I'm not saying, well, our history should have no interest in this because it's all about the market. I'm saying things are happening here that are really important. And indeed, some things are happening in biennials that can't really happen at the Broad. I mean, uh, you know, so let's look at that, and let's think about what kind of subjects they're implying and producing. I've also been tremendously moved by the arguments of somebody like Oakley and Weiser, whatever you think about him, this kind of will to globality is, I think, a very moving concept. Like, who are we to, de you know, deny, you know, someone anywhere from, like, desiring to have a global public, you know? Um, who are we to prejudge that as some sort of a hostile market pandering thing? So the artists that I tend to really admire are people like, you know, Georges Abadbo. You know, he's like, okay, I'll be in your Venice Biennale. And then, like, he's, like, performing, you know, his, like, little outsiderness. And But here's this picture of Elvis, and here's this picture, you know, you know Sarkozy. And here. I mean, like, he's totally current. And he's just insisting on you recognizing that he's going to be talking about you from where he's sitting in his corner at the Venice Biennale by the stairwell or the toilet or, you know, wherever they put him. So it's artists that I admire who make you embarrassingly embarrassed and aware of the operations that are going on around the work and through the work and in the work. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's um, you know, it's kind of pro-artist, this book. Um, not every artist. Yes. I'm wondering if we can, or if you can, uh, kind of, work, well, like, I, I could say we will return to Mondrian, but it doesn't have to be about Mondrian, but the, like, where abstraction sort of sits in your argument between kind of that realism and then ending up at a kind of, return, yeah. you know, what we could call a kind of return to figuration or something, right, these sort of bodies in a bath, right, that mm -hmm. looks like a landscape. Um, yeah, I'm curious thank about so sort of abstraction as a kind of international dream. Yeah, Whether thank you. Not, you know. it's, it's a beautiful question, beautifully articulated international dream. Um, so one of my chapters is about the founding of the Sao Paulo Biennial. And that is where this dream, for me, is acted out. So it both breaks my thesis, and then like all good theses, it kind of like proves it at the same time, breaks the rule, proves the rule. So um, the founders of the Venice Biennale, my most exciting historical archival moment was when I found an artist writing to the founder and saying, at last, no more mulattoes and fishermen. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I can't believe they're just saying it. So they gave the first prize to Max Bill, you know, concretism, I mean, it was all abstract immediately. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that a peripheral place had just said, like, no, we'll just be international. Like, we're not going to paint fishermen, mulattoes, no, no, we're just going to be international, which means geometric abstraction, you know, that's the, we're down with that. Um, it lasted really briefly, but it generated for me the most powerful moment of post-colonial theory, which was the revival of anthropophagia. So for me, artists like Lee Gay Clark and Elio Widichika are just, they're just unabashed heroes. So I, I don't have any distance, I don't have any like, oh, I mean, I'm just all in. I'm all in and I'm seeing them as refusing the predicated internationalism, but through difference. And for me, that's just tremendously powerful. So when Wida Chica shows up in the information show in New York, he's like, Brazil is a country that doesn't exist. I'm not here to represent Brazil. I refuse to think about it. But of course, he said Brazil in three sentences, right? Um, and he's, what he's theorizing through the work is that he's making situations and provocations. And they're going to come down. And wherever they come down, they're going to play out differently, and that's up to you. It's just brilliant. And so. My argument is that a curator like Zeman is like, oh, I can use that, right? But Zeman doesn't invent that. He just distributes it. He just makes it a market. 
right? Um, so I'm interested in those moments. I celebrate them. Um, it's not that abstraction is really international. It's not that Mondrian is really autonomous. Um, it's how those narratives are mobilized and what they're made to do that really interests me. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, Nora. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, I guess, criticality or this notion of criticality? And it's the same question, you know, like maybe that you can continue to talk about um, how this narrative of internationalism sometimes fails and falls into the dominant stylistic mode, and how sometimes it it succeeds. Um, because it seems to me that, you know, I'm often so confused as to determine which right. um, moment is critical or not or when. So could you speak so, a little so yeah, bit So that? part of the responsibility of critical globalism, which might sound kind of heavy-handed, um, is ours. So um, this is a book that, that calls to the viewer and the visitor to be, you know, doing the work, doing the work of the art. Um, so let's just take the bathtub. Let's just take um, the Westerners, you know, sitting in. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is a project that predates its inclusion into the biennial. It was actually commissioned by Jane Farber, the dear, late lamented Jane Farber, for the Queens Museum of Art. Sai wanted to work with the community of Queens. He was enormously moved by the, the American narrative of the melting pot. He was enormously moved by this very polyglot community of people in Queens who were from all over the world and spoke all these languages, some of which he knew. And in typical cycle grown fashion, you can't really tell how cynical he's being or how innocent he is. It's just not, he's, he's kind of Warholian. He's not gonna, he's not gonna reveal that. He's hiring his doctor from China to prescribe medicinal herbs for the community of Queens. He wants to heal the working man. You know, um, the piece is taken up by curators and put into the Lyon Biennial, which is what you're seeing um, here on the left, I think. Um, I can't remember which one is Queens and which one is Lyon, but um, they put it into a biennial about, you know, partage d'exorcisme, you know, like it's curated by Hubert Martin, you know, we, we are all the other, you know, we are also métissage, you know, we are, right, so they're doing the work of global, but it's up to us, the visitor, to sort of sit in that thing and decide how embarrassed we feel as half-naked Westerners sitting in a Chinese artist thing and we all, and buying it, you know, so, so I like this piece because it very aggressively puts us in the hot water. Um, as Donna Haraway would say, we have to sit with the trouble. We have to sit with the trouble. We can't critique it away. We have to just sit in it. And I have this wonderful picture that I found on Sai's website and got him to send me to put in this book of Barbara London from the Museum of Modern Art in the Queen's installation. And she's going like... <laughs> and Sai is in the back and like, seems to have a beer in his hand, you know, with two buddies speaking fluent Chinese or whatever, you know? Um, and kind of Barbara's me, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, totally unsure about the politics of this piece. Like, I have to do that work. I have to look at other works by this artist. I have to think about what this artist kind of means by the accumulated force of this work. This shows up in Naoshima as part of a special Japanese art tour, right, that you can go to this special island in Japan, you know, just like be in this hot tub, you know, and that's like a triple iron, right, because he has to import the hot tub from New York when it's going to Lyon, but it's actually a Japanese custom that's been Ameri Americanized by hippies, right, so the whole thing just gets you really thinking. Um, the, the curators in Lyon, you know, wanted to know if they should bring the water from Queens, like, is it like lures, you know? I mean, I love every part of this. I love every part of the history. I love every anxiety. I love the fact that this netting was actually just wrapped around the rocks and it was supposed to be thrown away, but when he put it out 
you know, when they kind of laid it out, it was like, it looked kind of like mountains. And, you know, all the mildew and the mold and the crap, you know, it looked kind of like, you know, kind of like Chinese mountains, you know, so he strings it up, you know. So I just love every part of the process of bringing these together and the, and the sort of dilemmas that it propels us into. And that it would feel very different if you went to it in Queens than if you went to it in this kind of like, same, you know, consume your metissage, you know, moment in the old. So all of that is, is super interesting to me. And Leon, after putting it in the biennial, you know, bought it, right? So mm -hmm. presumably we'll, we'll see it in some institutional fashion and it will continue to be interesting what, how, how it's inserted into the French narrative of otherness, you know, you know. I don't know if that gets, so, so that, in that case, the critical globalism is mine, because Sai's not, he's not telling me anything, except for his doctor's prescription and his love for the people. You know, he's not telling me anything about what, what to think. Any questions? Oh, well, let me try again something different. <laughs> I keep thinking about popular and unpopular, you know, Greenberg's unpopular art. And um, what you're doing is making this unpopular, right? By giving it a sort of dense reading instead of just having it be a sort of warm thing that. I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm also. I mean, that's a good thing. No, no, I mean, I'm also like, I wanted to go into the grand room. Yeah. I mean, I was like three weeks too late to get my ticket, but I, I wanted to go into the grand room. I wanted to feel what that was like. So, you know, I'm also just the happy child, innocent, you know, like I want to experience the rain, you know? I'm going to start asking where this critical global <laughs> idea, how it, how it moves forward, can it be articulated with something like that popular, unpopular um, um, notion that Greenberg puts forward? It's kind of following on Grant's remark earlier about abstraction, right, which was unpopular and then became popular and then it became I don't know. I, you know, it's a great question. I don't know if um, if it's a if it's a binary that works for me. I don't know if I know what to do with it. So in Brazil, abstraction was immediately popular. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have these amazing pictures of people pressed against the glass. You know, they couldn't wait to get in. In the back of the biennial catalog are illustrations for Noel furniture. I mean. The second they could afford that, they wanted that, right? That was not the problem with abstraction. It was, the problem was not that it was un, unpopular. The problem, you know, as Lydia Clark and, you know, Goulart and Rita Chica, you know, as they all started thinking was they just felt like there was a lot that we were, you know, wasn't getting talked about. And they also suspected the Rockefeller complex of the Knoll Furniture and the Museum of Modern Art catalogs. I mean, they just they just thought the whole thing started to smell. So, um, popular and popular. I mean, there is an element of the whole biennial culture that's just about the popular. So, you know, my Italian mathematician and her Polish Italian, you know, Polish mathematician husband, you know, they just like go to the biennial because that's where they're going to see contemporary art. I mean, they don't, they don't know where to go to some gallery, you know, you know, right? So there's some sense in which it's just, it's just like, hey, people, here's, here's the popular. We've done the hard thinking. Come see what it's all about, right? Um, and that's definitely a part of it. And certainly, the World's Fairs were all about that. You know, we'll have our shilling days, and we'll have the day when only the queen comes, and we'll have, you know, I mean, it was all about that, those forms of address. Um, the other anecdote that I discovered the history of that got me super excited was how even the worst art could become provocative and critical in the right, with the right audience. So Hiram Powers' Greek Slave, I don't know why, but I just thought, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look at that, I'm gonna follow that through the fairs. And in the 1851 Great Exhibition, abolitionists and freed slaves from the US performed the Virginian slave in front of that thing at the Great Exhibition. I mean, that's amazing. I had no idea. Nothing in art history had taught me about that, right? So I think when you go to these things, when you, when you go to them as historians, you, you just find amazing performatives around the art that you just didn't know were possible. How even bad art can mobilize 
a kind of critical internationalism. Yes? I remember seeing that piece in Lyon. Um, and did I you had, only see it? <laughs> or did you immerse? <laughs> I was there for a short time. It was a quick visit, so okay. I didn't immerse, yeah, immerse. But I also remember there was another piece, I can't remember the name of the Chinese artist, that was an aviary. It was literally a bird aviary. And I think this is in I think he stuck some birds about, in here. But I no, it was, a, it was a different one. It, it had perches. Okay. And what, what I uh, remember is that at a certain moment around 2000 and then extending into the Venice Biennale in 2001, where you had Ernesto Neto's a kind of immersive environment. Sure. The spices and you know, sort of multi-sensory. I think there was just a moment of the, this type of immersive installation that was happening in biennials at that moment that also begged a certain amount of audience interaction. And this maybe is less related to what you're writing about here and more related to what you wrote about in Sensorium. And I think that a lot of these projects are about the body of the viewer, about an immersion in some kind of environment. Yes, it's spectacle, but this has been characteristic of biennials for the past you know, 15 years yes. in some form or another. Yes. And also, I think it leads into things like Utopia Station and the idea of trying to bring a sort of, call it social or public practice, into a biennial format. So I think it's indicative of something else. So the question I have here is, do you talk in the book about the idea of the reception of, a, of the biennial, how one circumnavigates, how one you know, meets the moment for the rest, to the sort of walking through the Giardini, like the whole physicality of, of trying to take in the enormity of yeah, I mean, that's totally there, and it kind of goes back to Nora's question and Jennifer's. I mean, you know, there's always Illy, you know, there's always the Nesca, you know, the little espresso stopped, you know, to keep you going, and, you know, isn't that nice that they've sponsored that catalog? And I mean, you know, you're wrapped into that. Um, I think what interests me in the book is the fact that experience became a kind of, you know, teak or something. Mm -hmm. So it was, Experience de la durée in Lyon and uh, the experience of art in Venice and you know so these things they they they're like trends you know but I'm also interested in the kind of mega trend that the festal atmospheres and events that were outside the art pavilion mm -hmm. are now inside the art mm -hmm. so one of the things I argue is that the contemporary art world has sort of thought with the fair about what people, you know, what might be interesting to bring into the art world. So, um, I don't have any historical evidence for that. I don't have like an artist in an archive saying, I love the moving sidewalk, I'm going to bring that into my artwork, you know. Um, but the fairs were, of course, splendiferous, multifaceted, you know, extravaganzas of all kinds of sensory delights. Um, and part of the the blind epistemology is tracing that all the way back to the Great Exhibition. Uh, you know, where, you know, there's this article, How a Blind Man Saw the Exhibition. You know, the dusty streets, you know, the smell of the tea shop, right? I mean, so that's, that's there. Um, but, of course, for that visitor, the art was a respite. You know, the art was the cool marble that he could feel. You know, I mean, so what's interesting now is how much of it comes into uh, the working of the art with itself. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I think maybe we're already tired of it in the sense of, uh, you know, I mean, Oakley's Venice Biennial did not really have much of the immersive, although in the national pavilions he still had some interesting exemplars of that. So, you know, these are, these are styles, these are genres, so we'll see what happens to them. Um, but I think, yes, their relationship to difference is really interesting. And, you know, again, it's up to us. When we shuffle through the coffee, do we end up critiquing you know, agribusiness, or do we think romantically about Colombia? You know, I mean, it's it's like the art has a lot of responsibility, and then we have responsibility for what what we make of all that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, so feel much. free to email me with any questions you're too shy to answer. <laughs> <laughs>